All right, today we're uh, talking about fuse boxes, or in our case, circuit breaker boxes, since they don't make fuse boxes anymore. Um, before we even start with getting into the box, if you have an old fuse box and your wiring is good, do you have to replace it with a circuit breaker box? And I'll give you a reason why not if you really don't have to because of your insurance company or uh, regs in the city you live in. Has anybody ever seen a bad fuse? I didn't say a blown fuse. I said a bad fuse. Has anybody ever seen a bad circuit breaker where they fail to trip? Okay, that happens frequently. All right, so if a fuse doesn't go bad, what's wrong with a fuse box other than the older wiring that's in it, okay? So if you have an old fuse box and the wiring is in decent shape, there's no pressing need to replace it if you don't have to for whatever reason by adding circuits or your insurance company requires it. Um, other than that, uh, let's go on to the tools. Um, I have a different class of tools showing here than you would normally see during one of my classes for either basic wiring of switches and outlets or ceiling fans. Uh, and the reason is simple. If you're working with fuse boxes, and especially if you have to work live, these are insulated tools, okay? Uh, they are actually insulated to a thousand volts. And it just gives you another layer of protection uh, so that you can't ground the screwdriver to the case or anything if, if you have to work live. When I say have to, if there's any way around it, you don't want to work live. Okay, you want to be able to kill the circuit breaker box if, in fact, you're going to be run, uh, working on it. But sometimes, like in a business like this, if I have to start changing a breaker, I cannot kill that fuse box because it's running everything in the store, including computers. All right, so I can't do that. So I have to be very selective in the tools I use when I'm working on a live fuse box or circuit breaker box, as the case may be. Um, Jay, if you want to, here's two handouts. And we got more here, but those are two separate ones. <clears throat> OK. Uh, let's take a look. First off, we'll get started into the circuit breaker box. But uh, just so you know and familiarize yourself with it, this just happens to be your meter box, okay? There's many variations of it, but this is a standard meter box for, a, for basically a single family home or maybe two flat, three flat, so, something like that. You own this box. The only thing ComEd owns is the meter that goes in it, all right? So this it belongs to the building including the pipe that goes up the side of the building and the head and the wiring inside it. This is all belongs to the building. So it's your responsibility to maintain it. The only thing ComEd does is hook up at the head from the pole and install the meter. That's it. Okay, that's as far as ComEd goes. If you have a problem at the hookup, let's say one of those connections burnt, that's a ComEd pro problem. But can you call an electrician and have them fix it? Yes, you can. It all depends. Usually ComEd's pretty good when they get a call like that of a, of a service that's out. They usually respond fairly fastly for that kind of thing, unless, of course, everybody's out everywhere because of storms. All right, but normally they, they're pretty responsive when it comes to a service being out. I've seen them come within an hour. 
you know, which is extremely fast. But, all right, so, again, your typical wiring for, you know, the, uh, your service, your wiring coming in from the service head down the pipe, connects, meter goes in, wire goes out to your panel box. Fairly straightforward. Excuse me, what's coming, what voltage is coming into that box? In this case, it would be 240. 240. So we split it in half then. Well, you have 220 volt lines coming in. Okay, one, two. This would be your neutral. And there would be 240 across the red and black, right? Right. It's 120 and 120. Now, if this was a three-phase box with three hot wires coming in for like bigger buildings like this, okay, you'd have 120, 120, and 240 for um, a hot lake delta service, or if you had uh, a service like we have across the street, you'd have 320 volt lines. They don't have a hot leg, a, a, a high voltage leg. Do you have to have a permit to put in a hundred uh, larger amperage box? I'm going to get to that during the class, by the way. <laughs> okay. So, building owns this. Just know that, you know, also these have to be grounded. It's mandatory that your service is grounded. Normally there'd be a pipe coming out here, an eight foot rod into the ground, and this is the kind of thing that you'd see connected to that rod in the ground. If the connection is buried, there'd be a slight variation of this. Okay, they're bronze um, connectors that won't corrode underground. Uh, some people, some suburbs uh, want their ground connections actually buried in the ground. So be aware of that also. All right, once we bring our power in, You can start to see um, how we're, we're wired. We have our main power again, neutral and two hots. Normally in Chicago, you won't see a separate ground coming in. All right. But in, in the suburbs, if they're using buried cable uh, with PVC, yeah, you're going to start to see separate grounds coming in. That's the only reason I put a ground on here right now. In Chicago, you usually will not see that ground because the pipe is the ground. But if, if you're using a plastic service coming in, you need that ground, okay? <clears throat> you can start to see also, I've got a couple different types of breakers in here. Uh, some of them have buttons. Uh, some are dual breaker, all right. Um, if you have an air con a big air conditioner for your house or whatever with the compressor outside, normally you're going to have a dual breaker for that compressor. And sometimes with big hot tubs, you'll see a dual breaker. Your single breakers, and then what we have are a GFI breaker and an arc fault breaker. In the city of Chicago, the arc fault breaker is required in bedrooms, okay? Uh, the reason for that was that um, originally most people had, you know, especially in children's rooms or whatever, the beds had wheels on them. Uh, older houses, they only had possibly, you know, one outlet in a bedroom. Things were rolling over extension cords and causing fires, okay? Arc fault breaker is designed to detect that kind of shorting. Um, there are now arc fault outlets also, but that only protects from the outlet 
uh, to where the device is itself, okay? This will protect all the wiring all the way back to this breaker. So if there's a problem in your piping or in the house wiring also, this will detect it. So just a, a, a better form of arc fall protection. It protects the whole circuit, not just the extension cord where it's plugged in at. This started to be required, I believe, in 98, somewhere around there, I think. Um, GFI, again, you don't need GFI breakers, but it gives you the option, all right? Of, of protecting uh, whole circuits. Just be aware of a wiring requirement for both of these, uh, and they're harder to install in older, older buildings um, because they need what's known as a matched pair. <clears throat> if you'll notice on my wiring, I have a hot and a neutral tied together, all right, for these two. The reason for that being is that you can run, in Chicago, you can run three hots to one neutral, all right, but at that point you can't install a GFI breaker because it'll find that other voltage from the other hot lines that are supplying the neutral. It cannot compare one to one at that point because you got three hots to one neutral. So you cannot install a GFI breaker in that case. You have to identify a pair and keep that pair separate all the way to that GFI, all the way to the devices where they're going to be plugged in. You cannot tap off another hot and then into that neutral, the GFI will just blow at that point, and you'll never be able to reset them. Same thing with the arc fault. They have to have a matched pair, okay, because they're comparing voltage between the neutral and the hot and, the, and now in the ground. <coughs> and when we, um, GFI breakers now, all right, before they didn't require a ground which was one of the reasons for using them. If you had old wiring, all you had was a hot and a neutral, and it was all cloth wiring, and you didn't have a ground because it wasn't in pipe. Now, the GFIs will not work without a ground. All right, I've had people that have come to me after I sell them a GFI and says, it doesn't work, it's new. And I said, how did you test it? They said, well, we pushed the buttons. I said, okay, you were pushing the buttons and you couldn't set it. Were you holding it at the time you were pushing the button? And he said, yes. I said, you have to screw it to the box. Without it being grounded, you can't even set these new GFIs. So just be aware that it could be all nicely wired and you're holding it trying to, you know, before you screw it to the box and trying to set it with the buttons, it won't set because it's not grounded. <laughs> Just be aware of that little fact now. They are very sensitive to that fact. In fact, the last ones I installed, I had to have them screwed tight to the box before I could set it. Not just the screws going into the box a little bit and it's still floating. And I was trying to set it and it wouldn't set. I had to set those screws tight to the device before it would set. It needed a solid ground. So be aware of that little fact. All right, what other kind of wiring do we have? I mentioned air conditioners or hot tubs or whatever. Um, you'll notice that we have a little sub box here. Um, this is basically for inside, okay, that we can use. If we had, in fact, 200, in this case, I've got two separate breakers here, but if we were gonna use it for an air conditioner or whatever, um, or an electric furnace, you would have your heavier wire going to it, all right? Here I've got uh, this set for 240 volts, 
So I have my two hots. I have a separate ground just because I could at that point. I wouldn't need it if it's in pipe. And the neutral if in fact you need it. So these are all wired together as a set going somewhere. All right. And that's the only reason why these are tied together to help identification when you're working in the box. Um, set it up that way so if somebody comes in and they can see the different colors and there's a reason for using different colors and that's identification. If, if you can't, you know, if you can't identify what wires are where, then you have to have trackers and everything else under the sun in order to identify them. That's why they make them, but this also provides visual identification of what circuit is going where. And if you're at the other side of the building and you come up and I go, oh, gee, a purple and a white. And I can go into my box and see another pair, purple and white, and what breaker it goes to. More than likely, that's it. And you can, at that point, turn that breaker off to try and identify it and work on the circuit. So it's relatively easy if, in fact, you have different colors going in to the different breakers. And you won't be able to do that. There's only a certain number of colors out there, so some of them are going to have to repeat, all right? But it still makes identification a lot easier if you have a dozen different colors and a dozen breakers. Green is always ground. White is always neutral. Is that, in fact, always going to happen in your box? Uh, if you're setting it up, yes. If you're somebody that's going on a service call, I've seen too many hot whites and I've seen too many hot greens. Okay? It's just people not knowing what they're doing, and they had white or green wire laying around, and they used it for a hot, and didn't even label it with a black wire, which you should be doing, okay? Just as we label a black wire with white tape for the neutral, all right, if, in fact, you had to reuse a white wire and turn it hot, mark it with red or black tape. At least so somebody knows that this is no longer a white wire. If they, you know, take that wherever it's hooked up and see, you know, red or black tape over it, you're going to know that somebody's reused that wire. Where does that happen a lot? Uh, a lot of times it'll happen when you turn a standard outlet into a dual voltage outlet where you need... 240 volts going to a dual voltage outlet, all right, and sometimes they'll just have to reuse a neutral as another hot, okay, because you need two hots for these dual voltage outlets. You also still need a neutral, so if there's multiple wires in that box, they can sometimes turn one of those wires into a hot and relabel it. It's very common to see that in older buildings that have put in dual voltage outlets. And normally that's for window air conditioners, your heavier window air conditioners that need a 240 volt hookup. <clears throat> and again, your little sub boxes, um, if I wanted to feed from here, but I also wanted to shut off right near a device, let's say a hot tub or something under that, under the grills, where I could just shut my hot tubs off you know, uh, both the motor, you know, and the heater type thing. I can do it right there, and I don't have to go back here to shut it off. I can shut it off right at the service point. So you'll see these common, uh, usually around hot tubs under the, under the cowlings or whatever, where we can just shut things off and or pull out a pullout and kill the electric. Pullouts are more common um, outside where your air conditioner compressors are. You usually see a, a, a gray box similar to this on the wall. You lift up the cover and there's just a little pull out and you just pull it out and it just takes the electricity off while you're working on the, on the compressor. So they're both common pull outs and shut offs like this. Again, different color wiring, all right, to identify where they're going. Just
You know that, you know, this may be the heater and this may be the pump. <coughs> It'll give you an idea where your things go once you open up other boxes and you know what's what. That's why we try and use different color wiring. On one of your handouts, you will see, you know, a little explanation on using wire ties. And is that a good idea or not? Uh, obviously, you know, they're saying, eh, I never heard anything. And it doesn't. It just keeps it neat and clean. And it also identifies your pairs if, in fact, you need, need pairs, okay, for your advanced wiring. One of the other handouts you'll see um, has a new type of breaker box listed. That's an old document, by the way. It's, a, it's one of the white copies, not the colored copy. Uh, the new box is made by Leviton. Uh, they're on the market now, but they're very limited uh, in distribution at this point. Uh, I wanted to get one, and I couldn't even get one. Uh, they do have some advanced features. Um, what you will see on the new Leviton box is a whole different type of wiring instead of wiring to the breakers as I have here, all right, the newer boxes do all their wiring internal in the box. The breaker just bridges the hot to where the wires bolt into the box, not to the breaker. They're a different type of breaker, all right? So all your wiring, even before you install the breakers, is done to the box itself. And one of the newer features of that box, besides a different type of breaker, is they now have what are known as, go figure it, smart breakers. All right, if a breaker trips, it can notify your phone, your obviously your cell phone, uh, that it has tripped. Can you reset these breakers on your phone? No. You still have to come in, flip the breaker on and off, okay, and set it, reset them manually. Why would you want a smart breaker? Um, I could think of at least one reason. Uh, maybe your refrigerator freezer that has a couple hundred dollars worth of food in it. Maybe that's one you'd want to be notified that it's tripped while you're away somewhere. So you can notify somebody to go check it and find out what's going on. The same thing is, would you ever want your refrigerator on a GFI circuit? No, it's not recommended. Okay, even if you have a water purifier in there for ice cubes, it is not recommended to put your refrigerator on a GFI circuit because the motors and compressors can affect the GFI electronics and trip them before they should trip. So that's why they, they recommend not to, you would think, especially if you have your water hookup, that you would want GFI protection, but they say no. Because most of the time, your outlet is behind the refrigerator anyway. You can't get to it. Okay, so there's no touch in this outlet or anything, so you can't get it out to begin with. So that's why they recommend no GFIs for refrigerators and or freezers. Any questions so far? Um, all right, what are we looking for when we're going to install a new uh, breaker box. First off, why do you want to install it? I mean, is it a requirement of some sort or you just want some more modern wiring, which means you're going to have to pull a whole bunch of new wiring uh, to begin with. If you have old cloth wiring, uh, sometimes you can alleviate a lot of new wiring simply by putting what's known as a wiring trough in connection with your breaker box. So all your connections are in here 
and not inside the breaker box. They don't want any wire nuts inside a breaker box. They want your wiring all solid in a breaker box. They don't want connections in there. All right, so that's where these wiring troughs come in. All your connections are then in here and not down in the breaker box. And of course, if you have all that, all that cloth wiring, you're not going to want to replace it anyway if it's in good shape. So therefore, all your connections would go up in here and all your good wiring is then down in the breaker box. Question is, why do you want to replace it and, and where do we go from there? Uh, if it's an old fuse box, you may have six fuses and you want to do a little house rewiring or let's say you need more, more circuit breakers. Um, this is one of the smaller boxes out there. Um, this actually can have 10 breakers besides the main. All right. That's pretty good for, you know, your average apartment. Your newer houses probably have a 20 space panel or more. Um, that's just because they're normally uh, 200 amp panels instead of 100 amp. But for your normal apartment or condo, <coughs> the minimum is now 100 amp service for an apartment type condo, uh, which is way up from what they were. So in a lot of cases, when you see some of these six flats or, or more, they have big services come in because every apartment has to have 100 amp service for it to be a legal condo. I'm sure there's a bunch of illegal ones out there, but you know, that, that is the requirement. So, do you need more power? Um, do you need more breakers, more circuits? Because obviously, you know, apartments way back when sometimes had two or four circuits, uh, and now you have two air conditioners and a big refrigerator and you keep popping, you know, fuses or breakers. So you need bigger service, you have to add circuits and so on and so forth. So you want to know, number one, how many circuits you're going to need. If it's just a straight replacement, that's fine. You know, there's not too many calculations you'll want to do. But if you need more circuits, and this is to answer your question, let's say you're going from a sub 100 amp, you know, maybe it was a 50 or a 60 amp and you're going up to 100 or 150 or 200 amp service. Um, can you do it yourself? No. Um, I'm sure you can do some of it, but number one, you're going to need a permit and you're going to need the permit because Commonwealth Edison, when they come to hook up the new service, is going to ask your electrician for the permit number. It's the first question they ask when the ComEd truck pulls up to hook up the new service. Where, who, who's got the permit? Where's the number? All right. So, because they have to pull new wiring. And they're not going to do that if it's an illegal hookup. They want to make sure that this has been done by a pro, that it's all good to go, when they hook up their their higher power, all right. So, and most of the time on on the older circuits, you'll see you know the ComEd wiring is relatively thin, all right. And as the amperage goes up, their wire gets bigger to handle that additional amperage. You know, 100 amp panel can get away with uh, number four or number three. You know, this happens to be number three. But a 200 amp panel needs either zero or one aught or one, okay, a little slightly heavier wire, and you'll be able to see that on the overhead wires. If you jump from a 60 amp service to a 200 amp service, they've got to string new wire from the transformers to your house. Where's the permit? First question going to be out of their mouth. So yes, your and you may need at that point a whole new service in size 
to handle the bigger wires. All right. So who's going to install all that? So the short answer is, yeah, you're probably going to need an electrician and a, and a permit in order to pull a heavier service. Um, for a new, well, it depends on the square footage of the house, but most of the newer houses I've seen are all 200 amp. Uh, for a apartment building that has been converted to condos, that must have at least a hundred amp coming into each apartment. I don't think there's any requirement if you're remodeling an apartment building that's still going to be an apartment building. All right, as far as I know, there's no requirement there. But obviously, if you're depending on you know the rents you're charging, you're not going to want somebody complaining about blown fuses all the time and blown circuit breakers. So you have to supply them with enough power to run. You know, obviously, in, in especially days like this, you know, probably people have one or two air conditioners going at this point, and that's kind of hard if you have very limited power in the, into an old apartment. So yeah, you have to supply them with a, enough power to run, you know, microwaves, toaster ovens, bigger refrigerators, you know, all your counter appliances. Hate to tell you, but one hair dryer will max out a circuit. So if you have two ladies running, you know, rent, renting an apartment, and each one has a hair dryer, <laughs> believe me, it causes problems. <laughs> Because, you know, 15 to 18, you know, uh, 100 watts maxes out a 15 amp circuit just about. You run two of those, then you keep popping the circuits in the bathroom. You know? And sometimes, especially in the older buildings, you know, you don't have one circuit for bathroom. You might have the bedrooms on it or even a kitchen circuit or something, the lights. So it's not all in a new house. You usually have in a in a kitchen now at a minimum you'll have three circuits going into a modern kitchen if not four or five, um, one for the refrigerator, one for a dishwasher, one for the lights, and then probably two more for counter outlets um, with all your stuff going on the counters. Bathroom now, modern bathroom will have at least two circuits into it. Uh, simply because of that hair dryer thing going on, everybody's got you know little plug-in doodads that uh, they electric toothbrushes and everything like that now. Electric shavers, God knows you know your your uh, sanitizers for your, your uh, um, what you put in your eyes, you know. Every, everything's electric. It requires more and more power. Um, all right, so we've identified if you need a bigger service, you're probably going to have to pull a permit, you know, just because if ComEd gets involved, that's their first question, because they don't want to hook up to something substandard and then all of a sudden the fire starts, so they, that's their first question. Uh, how do we measure, uh, let's say you, you want to at least identify your old box. How do you identify, you know, the amperage pulling? Well, number one, it'll be rated somehow. You know, this is, again, a 100 amp main. Doesn't mean I'm pulling a 100 amp at any period of time. Um, but can I measure that? Sure. And that's, that's with, you know, what they call an amp meter or a clamp meter. Clamp being, you know, the operative term here. Once you clamp this around a wire, and it's set for amperage, okay, it will read whether this needle or a digital version, okay. I'm not touching anything at that point. All I'm measuring is what's going through that wire, all right. And whatever's going through that wire will measure on the meter. 
All right, I don't have to touch anything with, with wire probes or anything. You know, it, it'll now measure what's going on that, what's being pulled through this wire. And that's basically how you use a clamp meter. All right, will this do voltage? Yeah, I plug my leads into here and I can check my voltages just like a normal uh, volt ohm meter, except that just has the advantage of being measuring amperage also, this being an analog, that being a digital. Um, again, why did I show, you know, a different class of tools? Simply because we're getting into heavier wiring now, replacing not only, you know, your, your standard house wiring, but you're also, you're, you're working with, with very heavy wire here, which in some cases requires heavier cutters. You know, just be able to cut that wire unless you're using a hacksaw, which is very time consuming on copper. <coughs> and again, the reason I show the heavier tools is because sometimes you have to work live, preferably not, but you can see there are special tools designed to work live also. Any questions so far? All right. Um, we've evaluated our old box. You have to know how many breakers you want. You can go up and, again, get any kind of a box you want, this being one of the smaller ones. <clears throat> can you get a 20-place 100-amp box? Yes, you can. We have them. Um, you can run, by the count of your breakers, 150% in a, in a house. So if I have a 100 amp breaker, technically I could have breakers that total 150 amp here because nothing's on at the same time, usually. Um, yeah, during the summer, your air conditioner is going to be your big draw. Um, if you have, an, uh, during holiday period, especially if you have electric ovens and stoves, you know, during the holiday period when everybody's cooking for families, yeah, that's going to be one of your bigger draws too when both ovens are going and the stove top is going and you're drawing your max 50 amp right there on one appliance. But normally, you don't have all the lights on in the house at the same time. They don't have all the TVs going at the same time. They don't have all the hair dryers going at the same time. You know, this is all um, real cyclical stuff. So that's why they say you can run up to 150% of the main and still be safe and still operate normally. Once you start going over that 150%, then that could start causing problems. So you always want to be aware that most of those breakers are going to probably be 15 amp breakers. Uh, I've seen, although they're not common anymore, I've seen 10 amp breakers out there just for lighting circuits and things like that. If, if that's, you know, what they're running, nothing heavy on them. Uh, any questions so far? In your handout, you'll, you'll notice... Um, differences from what the pictures are showing and from what I'm showing here that's because they're not using conduit <coughs> whereas here technically this box is set up for conduit you'll see you know a bunch of bare grounds there where you see that you see that in Romex all right which is that plastic encased wiring uh, you'll have a hot you'll have a neutral and you'll have a bare ground Okay, the reason they have the ground in there is because it's plastic. have to have that ground in there. So that's the difference in some of the pictures you see. But the wiring techniques that you read about in there are basically the same. In something like this, I could have a half-inch pipe with six wires in it feeding down instead of three. And not one of those would be a ground. I could have three hots and three neutrals. You know, if I wanted, or I could have five hots and two neutrals, or six hots and two neutrals, but that's overloading a half, then I have to go back up to a quarter, or a three-quarter inch pipe. 
So you can, you can run multiple circuits and in, in piping that's where you'll see a lot that people will run multiple circuits in a pipe where here everything is a separate circuit coming down in, in, a, in a Romex box. They don't, the biggest you'll have is a two circuit uh, Romex where it'll have two hots, a neutral and a ground. All right, that's usually the biggest you'll see in, in standard Romex, whether it be 14 gauge or, or 12 gauge. So conduit makes it a lot easier to feed multiple circuits, but the wiring techniques are the same other than the grounds. Um, that pretty much wraps up where we're at, unless there's any questions. So walk me through, if you've got a 15 amp circuit, but you want to replace it with a 20 amp circuit, like your hairdryer example. Right. Well, 20 amp circuit requires 12 gauge wiring. I'll just leave it at that. Is it safe to put a 20 amp on 14 gauge because they're overrated by, in some cases, near 100%? Probably. If it was my house, I would definitely rerun 12 gauge if I could, especially on something that's going to get used near max. You know, it's like trying to run a 30 amp air conditioner on 12 gauge wire. Eventually the wire is going to give and it's going to melt. Uh, and more, more than likely it'll be the connections that will give because every time you have a connection somewhere you're adding resistance. Okay, whether it be in a pullout or the fuse, anywhere there's a connection, there's added resistance, and added resistance is extra heat. And a smaller gauge wire is going to heat up because it can't deliver the power necessary. So it keeps drawing more and more power through a small hose and it'll eventually heat up and where it's going to burn is usually at a connection somewhere. It's going to take something else out, whether it be your pull out for the air conditioner or in our case, it burned right at the compressor. And we had ad adequate wiring. It's just sometimes when ComEd starts dropping their voltage, that pulls more amperage, which causes more heat. <coughs> and it burnt at a connection. Luckily, we were able to replace that connection right there, and we were back up and running. But that's where normally you'll get your failures at some connection point in the circuit. Usually you won't, the wire itself in the pipe is not gonna disintegrate. It'll be where it's connected to something.